Some people are very well known for the things they got right. Take, for example, Edmund Haley Halley Holly. No doubt you're familiar with this comet. Every 76 years or so, the same comet reappears in the night sky and gets noted by the sorts of folks who put out films like Night of the Comet in the hopes of cashing in on the bit of hysteria that usually greets regular, periodic events. Presumably on the grounds that if you can predict when a thing will happen, that must be bad because everyone knows everything in nature is totally random and unpredictable. But Edmund Haley Holly Halley knew different. Or at least, he thought he did. All he needed to do was prove it. Haley Holly Halley was one of those annoying people who cropped up regularly in the 16 and 1700s who couldn't be bothered to specialize in one field of study and instead tried to master as many as they could. And pretty successfully, too. By the time he passed away in 1742, Haley Holly Halley had proved his worth in astronomy, geophysics, mathematics, meteorology, physics, and cartography. As a result, he had all the tools to hand to do what he did. Reading historical astronomical records is a lot of fun, especially in and around England. Most of it is what you might expect of a country as wet as England is. Tuesday, 11 p.m., continued dark and cloudy, poured rain out of the end of the telescope twice this evening. Wednesday, 9.45 p.m., continued dark and cloudy, wife insists I wear a scarf, poured rain out of end of telescope, scarf interferes with telescope adjustments. Thursday, no observations, refused to wear a scarf, died of pneumonia. That sort of thing. Fortunately, there were other observations that were both more interesting and also clearly recorded somewhere with better weather. And they went back a long time, hundreds of years, in fact. In reading these historical observations, Edmund Haley Holly Halley noted that at regular intervals, the comet would appear in the same bit of sky, cause quite a stir, and then disappear again. He saw reports of it in 1456, 1531, and again in 1607. When a comet appeared in the sky in 1682, Haley Holly Halley noted that it too was very similar to the earlier ones. That was enough for him to predict the same comet would return in 1758, a date he wouldn't live to see, but that did produce a comet at the expected time, which was named in his honor. Haley Holly Halley got other things right too. In 1676, he went to the island of St. Helena, observed the passage of Mercury across the sun, and realized if he could observe the transit of Venus and compare the two, he could work out the actual size of the solar system, which he then did. On the same trip, he cataloged, with the help of others, over 300 stars in the southern hemisphere. Haley, Holly, Holly turned to weather and invented the symbols on weather maps for trailing winds that still get used today. He pointed out how solar heating made the atmosphere move and defined the relationship between barometric pressure and height above sea level. And then, just to really solidify his reputation for getting things right, he financed the publication of Newton's Principia Mathematica after having consulted with Newton about proving Kepler's laws of planetary motion, discovering Newton had already proved it but hadn't told anyone, and then realizing the book on how to do it was going to be really, really important. In other words, Edmund Haley Holly Halley had a track record for observing well and being correct. Which is all well and good, as long as you overlook one particular theory of Haley Holly Halley's which, even by the standards of science in the 16 and 1700s, made very, very little sense. The kind of theory that, if we were to discover a scientist or a mathematician who proposed a theory like it today, we would see them discredited and all their previous and future contributions tossed out because they were so clearly wrong about absolutely everything ever. See, in 1683, in order to explain the fact that over the course of a hundred years or so, the magnetic north and south poles seemed to drift, Haley Holly Halley landed on the rather unique solution that there were, in fact, four poles. Two north and two south. And this could only be accomplished if the Earth, instead of being one mass throughout, was hollow. A hollow Earth.
This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Let's not be too hard on Edmund Haley, though. It can hardly be said that we've never believed the Earth to be hollow, or that there were people or things living in those hollow places. The idea of subterranean realms has been with us for thousands of years. Take those pesky Greeks. To them, the underworld was a place accessible from Earth. At the moment of death, a soul would go straight to the entrance to the underworld. There it would enter Hades, which, depending on who you heard it from, was either located at the outer bounds of the ocean, the ends of the earth, or in the depths of the earth. There the souls of the dead existed in perpetuity, as did a number of Greek gods, including Hades, for whom the place was named. And Persephone. Persephone, you'll remember, was kidnapped by Hades to be his wife. This he did by riding out of a crack in the earth and carrying her below. Her mother, Demeter, was so upset by this that Zeus eventually told Hermes to go to the underworld and return Persephone to her. Unfortunately, Persephone had a bit of a snack while there and was forced to return every winter. Hermes, on the other hand, took up a job as the underworld's usher, leading the souls of the departed to the gates to make sure they all got there and didn't just stand around cluttering up the overworld. And then, of course, there's Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice is bitten by a snake and dies on her wedding day. Orpheus goes to Hades to retrieve her, but can't follow the simple instruction, eyes front, and so loses her permanently. So clearly, the Greek underworld was a place you could get to directly from the surface of the planet, simply by traveling to the right location. According to the ancient Mesopotamians, Kerr, the place where the souls of their dead hung out eating dust and taking up space, could be accessed by going to the Zagros Mountains and locating a long staircase that went deep down into the underworld. So deep beneath the surface of the earth was it that Utu, the sun god, had to make a detour through it in order to get into position for sunrise on time the next day. And of course, the Christian hell is undoubtedly located somewhere deep in the bowels of the earth. In fact, many religions from many different periods and from a variety of different places have some sort of underworld or hell which is quite naturally located underground. The Celts had both the Irish gate to hell, Cruachan, and a series of tunnels that led to the underground land of the Tuatha de Danann. The Taino people of Cuba believed their ancestors emerged from underground caves, and the ancient Siberian tribe of Samoyeds disappeared into a cavern city to live inside the earth. So it wasn't entirely without precedent for someone to think that there might be such a thing as a hollow earth. And Halley did, in a way, offer up an explanation to the problem at hand. After all, how do you explain the drift of the magnetic north and south poles? Unless you are armed with information Halley didn't have because no one had it, your guess is as good as any, as long as it explains the observed phenomena. First, though, let's actually provide the current correct answer, so we can begin to see where Halley went wrong and what bits he got right. You'll be aware that your basic compass does not point to true north. Instead, it points at magnetic north. The magnetic field that causes this to happen is called the magnetosphere, and extends out about 65,000 kilometers from the Earth in great loops from south to north magnetic poles. This magnetosphere prevents us from all turning into mutants or space zombies or just being plain old non-existent by protecting us from solar and cosmic radiation. When you see the northern or southern lights, aurora borealis or aurora australis, you are witnessing the magnetosphere being very excited about encountering some of this radiation and doing its job. So far, so good. But how do we get that magnetosphere in the first place? Well, here's where things get a little tricky. Depending on how much credit you want to give to Halley, and how much you think he was just making things up. Because the problem is, we're still working it out. We think we know a lot about it, but like most of good science, the more you learn, the more you discover how much you still don't know. One of science's chief goals is to open up whole new areas of ignorance and new things to be ignorant about. So remember, Halley thought that there were two extra poles for a total of four, two north, two south. Well, in explaining that and trying to show how it worked, he postulated that there was at least one, possibly more, 
inner spheres sort of floating around inside the Earth. We ran around on top, but just a few kilometers beneath our feet was a second, smaller sphere sort of held in equilibrium by means of the gravity of the whole system of spheres. To quote from the Journal for History of Astronomy, which provides a slightly clearer explanation than Holly's own writing, within the Earth, concentric to its hollow shell and rotating coaxially, he discerned another sphere whose existence had hitherto been unsuspected. Possibly there were further spheres hidden within that one. Both spheres had magnetic poles embedded within them at a distance from their common axis of rotation. A very gradual differential rotation between the two spheres accounted for the drift of the magnetic poles with time. One pair of magnetic poles was stationary, being embedded in the outer shell, while the other pair drifted westwards because the inner sphere was revolving at a slower rate. Halley's Earth was composed of an outer shell 500 miles thick, with an air gap of the same distance between it and the inner sphere. To the objection that the latter might collide with the outer shell, and thereby damage it, he explained that it was held at the center by the force of gravity. Halley pointed out that the ring environing the globe of Saturn, which remained coaxial to the planet, was held there by gravity though no one knew then that Saturn's rings were rotating. Well, that's nice and all, but the actual explanation for why the magnetic poles move around is there's a bit inside the Earth that rotates at a different speed than the outside. No kidding. The core of the Earth, the very center of it, is a solid ball of mostly iron and nickel, but immediately outside of it is a layer of super hot molten liquid which flows kind of like water. These are the inner and outer cores. Above that is the mantle, and above that is the crust, which is what we walk around on. The crust and the mantle, being more or less attached to each other, turn at the same rate. That is, once every approximately 24 hours they make one rotation. However, the solid inner core is turning much faster than that. Because the inner core is super hot, the outer core develops convection currents as the heat moves through it. Then, Convection currents of fluid metal in the Earth's outer core, driven by heat flow from the inner core, organize into rolls, creating circulating electrical currents which generate the magnetic field. Frankly, it's a vast, complex system, often called a geodynamo, and we're only really beginning to get to grips with it. But Halley's explanation was about as good as you could get at the time for what was going on with the magnetic poles. In essence, his details were a bit wrong, but the general idea was pretty sound. Well, except for the bit where he thought it might be possible to live in the internal gaps between the spheres. That was pretty out there. But still, we hear you saying, that thing about there being four magnetic poles, that was totally wrong. Well, yes, but also no, not really. Except maybe a bit. It's like this. Magnetic North Pole does move, and Halley was as accurate as he could be with the measurements he made and recorded, but he was slightly led astray by some faulty math and bad assumptions made by Newton in the first edition of Principia Mathematica regarding the relative densities of the Earth and the Moon, by about a factor of three, which meant the Earth had to be much, much, much less dense than the Moon in order for their orbits to work properly and keep the moon where it was, rather than running off and being a planet of its own. So Halley, in explaining the problem of the poles, had to somehow account for the vast difference in densities. Hence, the Earth is hollow. The North Magnetic Pole, until relatively recently, was about a thousand miles south of True North and drifted somewhere around nine miles a year. Then, in the 1990s, the rate of drift started to increase. As of March 2020, the rate is closer to 40 miles a year and headed towards Siberia. And it wasn't until very recently that anyone began to understand why. The problem is, as the European Space Agency put it when releasing their new study of the phenomena, tussling magnetic blobs deep below Earth's surface. Imagine, if you will, two giant blobs of magnetic force precariously balanced against each other. They are deep, deep down between the Earth's core and the mantle, 
one under Canada, one under Siberia. The relative strength of each of these blobs of magnetic flux are actually what helps determine the position of magnetic north. As these blobs change in strength, the pole wanders around a bit and it changes locations. Presently, since the 1990s, the blob under Canada has changed and weakened, which means the one under Siberia is stronger and so is pulling the North Pole towards it. Oh, and since we know that in magnets, opposites attract, we know that both these blobs are negative poles. Which, we think you'll remember, is at least two more magnetic poles than everyone in Holly's time thought there was. Again, sure, some of Holly's specific details were wrong for a variety of reasons, but taken from a wide enough view, parts of it were correct. Still, it's not a theory that holds much water on its own. Naturally, of course, there was a lot of interest in the idea of a hollow Earth, and not just for religious reasons, though there certainly was that. It wasn't long after Holly's initial theory was published that people began to latch onto it for their own purposes. In 1818, an American army officer named John Cleves Symes Jr. sent a letter off to absolutely everyone he could think of who might pay any attention at all, declaring that he believed the Earth to be hollow just like Halley did, but also that he believed it was easily accessible simply by locating huge openings at either pole and passing through them to the interior. The various kings, queens, college professors, noted scientists, mayors, and other significant persons largely ignored him, and the general public, once it got wind of the idea, basically turned Symes into a laughingstock. Still, Symes did manage to reignite an interest in Halley's earlier theory, but this interest was confined largely to authors of speculative fiction. Until Symes's involvement, hardly anyone had written about it. Ludwig Holdberg's Journey to the World Underground by Nicholas Klimius in 1742 was one of the first significant stories written about a hollow earth. In the story, a Norwegian boy falls through the earth's crust to the hollow interior. There he has adventures on an inner planet and on the concave shell and meets intelligent non-human life. In English, the first important example was written by an unknown author and called A Voyage to the Center of the Earth. Written in 1755, and definitely not by Jules Verne, it describes a socially and economically equitable utopia inside our world. Much like Holberg's work in 1788, Giacomo Casanova's Icosameron is concerned with alien life forms inside the Earth. But it isn't until 1864, after Symes tried to make such a big deal out of things, and Jules Verne published his journey to the center of the Earth, that things really take off. In the book, eccentric German scientist Professor Otto Leidenbrock posits there are volcanic tubes which lead deep into the center of the Earth. Leidenbrock, his nephew, and a guide descend into an Icelandic volcano, where they encounter prehistoric beasts and dinosaurs, tornadoes, and a vast interior sea. Navigating all these dangers and more, the party eventually emerges through another volcano back into the upper world in Sicily. The story proved popular enough that it opened up a whole genre of fiction called subterranean fiction. The next big hit in the genre comes from Edgar Rice Burroughs and features a world he calls Pellucidar. At the Earth's core, first serialized in 1914 in All Story Weekly magazine, tells the story of David Innes and the inventor Abner Perry. Perry has developed a vehicle for mining ore directly from the Earth's crust. Innes, Perry's friend and financier, has survived a harrowing adventure in which the machine, during its first test run, proves to be both unsteerable and unstoppable. It bores 500 miles straight through the Earth's crust and emerges into a truly hollow Earth below, the world of Pellucidar. Pellucidar is inhabited by every sort of prehistoric creature, as well as a tribe of relative primitives who are ruled over by vicious, evil, intelligent, flying reptile people called Mahars. Perry and Innes struggle with the local customs, fall in love with local natives, lead a revolt, and eventually, Innes leaves to bring help from our world back to Pellucidar. Burroughs, ever canny about the possibility to expand successful stories or abandon ones that didn't work, ends the novel with plenty of room for sequels. 
In all, seven novels were written by Burroughs himself, including one in which his most famous creation, Tarzan, finds his way to Pellucidar via airship and a polar opening. You can just about recognize every influence from early Hollow Earth speculations in Burroughs' work. The genre is a very pulpy and interesting one to read. The action barrels along page to page, pulling you with it, and because so many of them were initially published as magazine serials, practically every chapter ends with a cliffhanger that drags you on to read the next one. Most of the key stories were written prior to the 1950s, after which interest in subterranean fiction gradually waned towards the end of the 20th century. It's hard to say why exactly. By then, a lot of actual evidence had accumulated that the Earth was not, in fact, hollow, there weren't people living there, and there was nothing even remotely possible about surviving the experience should one happen to fall in. Still, this doesn't entirely explain why it has mostly fallen out of favor. Lots of science fiction still plays with tropes that are outdated or theories that have been shown false to good effect. Perhaps it's just waiting for someone good enough to grab hold of the genre again and run with it. Of course, there is still a place for these sorts of adventures elsewhere. For one thing, film adaptations of these stories have been going on for quite some time, starting in the 50s and 60s and running right through to today. In 2008, Journey to the Center of the Earth, starring Brendan Fraser, hit the big screen as a sort of sequel to the original novel and provided the requisite rollicking adventure yarn we've come to expect and enjoy. But never let it be said that Dungeons and Dragons has ignored a popular pulp genre, past or present. Beneath the surface of Toril, the planet of the Forgotten Realms' Faerun setting, lays the Underdark. And though it isn't quite a hollow Earth, it meets enough of the basic characteristics to qualify. Made up of a series of caves located at varying depths, not all of which are connected to each other, D&D's Underdark comes in three flavors, the upper, middle, and lower dark. The upper dark is considered to be the first three miles or so below the surface. Here is where the people of the surface most often meet and interact, for good or for ill, with the people of the underdark. The middle dark is where most of the underground civilizations reside, the Drow, Durgar, and Zvrfneblin. And the lower dark, ten miles or more below the surface, is very much to be avoided by almost everyone as only foul and dread creatures exist there. Basically, in D&D, the Underdark is much like the surface world, except cast in darkness and pretty much irredeemably evil. Except that one guy, you know, with the scimitars. See our episode. It's the place you send players once they've started laughing at your easy overworld-based adventures, just to remind them that there are challenges yet unfaced and most of it is derived from the underground worlds put forth by both religion and faulty science. Of course, if you really wanted to explore a hollow earth, you could try out Hollow Earth Expeditions, a game so pulpy and full of adventure that the dinosaurs have plenty of Nazis to eat. And so you've reached the end of another fun episode of GM Word of the Week. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. Just a little reminder that we have a YouTube channel now. If you find it easier to access episodes over YouTube, you'll find the link in the episode description on our website. Right now, we're still in the process of uploading old episodes, but those are mostly fun to listen to. At least, if you aren't us, because boy, have we come a long way since 2015. Also on our website, you'll find numerous ways you can help support the show. One of our most popular is to join up on our Patreon with a pledge of support. You'll get access to all sorts of little extras for a very reasonable amount. But don't be afraid to explore the other options on offer if they suit you better. All this and more can be found at gmwordoftheweek.com. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian... Tarzan didn't really need a lost adventure, Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Just before anyone starts writing in, yeah, we know people actually still believe the Earth is hollow. At least we've got them admitting it's round. <laughs>